Are you looking to become a better real estate investor? Then hang on because you're about to experience another episode of the world's most popular real estate podcast, The Bigger Pockets Podcast. But before we get to this week's show, I wanted to invite you to become part of our community, biggerpockets.com, the real estate investing social network. The membership is free and you'll instantly gain access to networking opportunities, educational content, investor tools, and more. Sign up now and get a free copy of our book, The Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Real Estate Investing, read by hundreds of thousands of budding entrepreneurs. Just click this link right here or just head to biggerpockets.com. With that, let's get to the show. This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 36. Hey, can I can, start? Can we, can, we, can we start? Do it. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everybody? This is Josh Dorkin, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co-host, Brandon Turner. Hey, Brandon. Hey, hey, Josh. How's it going? Going okay. How you, how you doing? I'm good. I'm doing something different on this podcast that I've never done before. Yeah, I know. You're you're sitting your lazy backside on a couch. <laughs> yeah, I got my microphone hooked up to my like couch with this big stand and I'm I'm like relaxing on my couch while recording this. Yeah, he's literally like laying out on, a, <laughs> on his couch. It's ridiculous. If there's any like chiropractors listening to the show, they would hate me right now for the way I'm laying, but that's yep. all right. Yeah, nice, I'll, nice. I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll live. That's awesome. Cool. All right, well, uh, yeah, good show today coming up. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah, but you didn't ask me how I'm doing. So, you sure know, what I, I said, hey, what's up? I think <laughs> I don't actually remember. Well, oh. I am doing I am doing well. However, I I do want to make a a note here as as uh, anyone who's listening may know the uh the great state of uh, Colorado has been uh undergoing some serious uh chaos. Uh the uh the flooding here has been really pretty awful. I mean, we, me personally, we were we were spared, but lots of folks uh, have uh, have dealt with some serious serious damage. I mean, tons of homeless people. Lots of people have lost a lot of their possessions, including uh, you know John Holdman, our our uh, our lead moderator on Bigger Pockets. He had a ton of damage to his house. A lot of other people I know did as well. Uh, so. You guys, if you're listening and you want to help out, I know the Red Cross is doing collections, so uh, you know please do give and donate to the Red Cross. Uh, it's a it's a good cause. There's there's some uh, real bad stuff happening here, so um, that's it. Just wanted to yeah get that out there. Nice, very noble. I'm, I'm a noble guy. <laughs> it's not true what they say about me. It's not true what they say about you. Yes, yes. Well. Listen. So la- la- last week we we started using uh, we started this new segment where we 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 asked listeners to share their favorite quote via Twitter, Facebook, or or G plus using hashtag Bigger Pockets. And last week's winner was Greg Jackson, who tweeted, "Life is too precious to spend doing something you hate," which is, as we like to say, awesome. 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 Yep. <laughs> yep. So Greg's going to win a free digital copy of the book on flipping houses and the book on estimating rehab costs by Jay Scott. So uh, big congratulations go out to Greg and Woo-hoo! thank you very much for uh, for tweeting that and getting the word spread about Bigger Pockets. We love it. We love yeah. it. Cool. And uh, of course, everyone else who did not win, I uh, want to encourage you to jump on this week and share your favorite quote from today's episode on your uh, social media. So next week you can win a digital copy of the book on flipping houses and the book on estimating rehab costs as well. Use hashtag bigger pockets on G plus Facebook or Twitter. And, uh, that will be awesome. And, and of course, if you missed last show, you'll know that our quick tip is no more. So no, more. no, 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 no more. Uh, but, uh, anyway, so thanks a lot to, uh, to, to Greg and, and to those people who, uh, tweet out this week's quote yeah 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 so uh why don't we why don't we move on to the meat of the show here uh today's guest is a long time landlord and weekly contributor to the bigger pockets blog kevin perk uh, kevin is based out of memphis tennessee and he's a real hands-on landlord so he's going to share a ton of tips today on buying rental property dealing with tenants property management and a whole lot more so uh 
get your pens out and ready. As always, uh, however, remember to jump onto the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show36. That's right, show36. To find links to everything we talked about today, and also to t- take a minute to, uh, to to leave a comment or ask Kevin any questions you have, uh, it, it's a it's a great way to interact with our guests. Uh, so so leave your feedback in the show notes at biggerpockets.com/show36. Uh, there's always a ton of great conversations happening there, so uh, you don't want to miss out on that. Without uh, further delay, why don't we uh, bring this guy on? What do you think? Uh, sounds good to me. All right, Kevin. What's up, man? Good to have you. Thanks, man. I really appreciate being here. Yeah, we appreciate having you. Let's uh, let's jump into it. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. All right. So, what what do you do? I mean, what's what's your story? Well, my wife Taryn and I are uh, buy and hold investors. Basically, we are landlords. Uh, we've been doing that for about ten years now uh, here in good old Midtown Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I buy smaller apartment buildings, duplexes, triplexes, things like that, even houses, uh, all buy and hold. That's what we do. That nice. is what you do. That is awesome. So you are actual real estate investors. Yes, sir. Yes, that not, is what not, we do. Not flippers. You're, you we are not flippers. We invest. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I'm just trying to start a debate here. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Come on, nope, t- yeah. take, take my bait. Take my bait. Do not bet on appreciation. <laughs> nice. Invest. Nice, nice, nice. All right, man. So, you guys are uh, buy and hold investors. How did uh, how'd that come about? How'd you decide to get involved in the industry? Well, you know, it's kind of funny how that started. Um, my previous life, before I got into this full time, I was a city planner. Uh, I was actually a planning director of one of the counties here around the Memphis, and um, I really couldn't see myself sitting at that desk for thirty more years. <laughs> you know. Uh, so, you know, my wife and I were kind of, but what do you do? I mean, you just, you don't know, you don't have the knowledge yet. And I was sitting on my porch reading one night and my wife kind of emphatically called to me, Hey, come here and watch this guy on TV. You know, I was like, well, what's she, you know, she's really being emphatic. I need to go see who this guy is. Well, it was Robert Kiyosaki and he was doing a PBS, you know, telethon thing, you know, where they have uh, fundraising and he was doing his cash flow quadrants. And so we sat and watched, and it was like, well, you know, this guy's making a little bit of sense. And I read his book, and then I, it, it went from there. It mushroomed from there. Uh, the real estate part of his book really made a lot of sense to me about uh, getting uh, income properties and people paying you, and that's really how it took off. Nice, nice. So, so what, what, what did the, the, the early days look like? You know, you guys saw this video, you bought the mm-hmm. book, and, and mm-hmm. you know, how, how did you go from there to now we own our first property? Uh, it was a lot of learning, you know, a long learning curve, uh, a lot of reading, a lot of uh, interacting, networking with other investors. Uh, we found a local RIA group and went there and, and talked to them. And our first property was a duplex. Uh, we kind of used Kiyosaki's thing, have, you know, get somebody paying you. So we bought a duplex, lived in one side, rented out the other, and they nice. paid the mortgage a note. And it was kind of like, wow, this works. And uh, we just kept buying more and more and more. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I always recommend people do that. Like the, the duplex, live in one half and rent the mm-hmm. other is such a good idea. I'm, it was. It was. It worked out well. Yeah. And you don't still live in that duplex, do you? No, no, no. I have since bought a foreclosure and fixed it up, and nice. uh, and and it's all right. But we still own the duplex; it's still there. Nice. That's exactly what I did. I lived in a duplex, lived in one half, and then I bought a foreclosure and live in that now. Mm-hmm. You guys are like buddies. I know. We're like I know Batman and Robin here. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, he he he's definitely your Robin, Kevin. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll be Robin. All right. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so how how do you normally? I mean, you've been buying more and more now uh, for the last ten years. I am assuming. Mm-hmm. So how how are you finding them? Well, I, I've found properties in all sorts of ways. Um, you know, I've driven by and seen the tall grass and send a letter, and and that's worked sometimes. Uh, uh, you know, all all sorts of things. But honestly, these days it's MLS listings. I mean, that's the honest answer. Uh, and kind of once you get up into the position, you know, you've been an investor for a while. Once Realtors see that you can close on an eight-unit apartment building. The deals are going to find you. Yeah, you know they're going to they're going to kind of bring them to you a little bit. Um, but that's the honest answer. Um, you know the foreclosures. You kind of got to wait till the realtor gets them and lists them and that sort of thing. And uh, it, it's 
ninety percent of it is MLS these days. Got it. Got it. So you're you're not doing any kind of marketing at this point or anything like that to to find properties. You're just waiting mm-hmm. for them to come your way from from your uh, selected group of one or more agents. Yes, yes, and I really don't even have a selected group of agents, uh, so to speak. Um, you know, there are just certain agents that deal with those type of multifamily properties, and uh, you know, there's a select group of buyers, I guess you could say. And so, you know, I'm just on that list. They call me. Do you buy any single family, or is it just multi now? No, I buy single families as well. Um, you know, I just look at the MLS every day. Um, I have a I have a search set up. It pings me if certain um, words are in the realtor's comments, like foreclosure or fix up or estate things like that, and uh, you know, prompts me to take a closer look at a particular property. All right. So so when you buy a property, um, a lot of people have the trouble is once they get four of them, they can no longer mm-hmm. buy anymore. And I'm assuming right. you have more. I mean. You obviously have more than four. I do. How do you, I mean, what do you do? Like, what's your solution for financing these things? Well, uh, we have been lucky in that, uh, you know, we started out before the four rule was in place. So we, you could get 10, which was before, when was that, 2007, when the, everything went to hell and the real yeah, estate crash? Seven, eight. Seven, seven eight, eight, somewhere in there. Uh, so we we were able to use that for quite a while, and of course by networking and and talking to other investors, we learned that you know you can put one in your name and then one in your wife's name, and you don't have to put them both on. So you're able to get a few more. But we've also always had uh, a line of credit and commercial financing with local banks, and uh, I've also had private lenders uh, finance properties for me or uh, help finance properties for me. So today. Since I can't get the four Fannie Mae, Freddie Mae backed loans anymore, um, uh, it's all commercial loans uh, and private lenders. Okay, nice. so is that even on like a single family house? You yes. might get a commercial loan. Yes, well, how, and a how commercial does that work? loan. Uh, basically, you would go in and talk to a local bank, and you you don't want to go to Bank of America uh, to <laughs> find these. You got to go to the local uh, uh, little little bank or your credit union. And you'll talk to the VP of new accounts or, or commercial financing there. And uh, basically, they'll, they'll review your portfolio and your business structure. And uh, they'll hopefully give you a line of credit. Um, I mean, it could be 100000 could be 500000 could be a million. And they'll let you, you know, whatever you want to buy with that, uh, go get it. As long as it appraises and works out and all that sort of thing. All right. So th- this is something that's really fascinating to me because, you know, I, I am like you. I want to buy property and I use private lenders sometimes, but I do not have a giant line of credit that I can play with. Mm-hmm. But I would mm-hmm. love a giant line of credit that I could play with. So I'm wondering, uh-huh. like, I mean, if I I mean, if I go into the bank and tell them, you know, hey, look at my portfolio I've got so far. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I guess I, I just have a hard time believing that a bank's just going to say, yeah, you know, this 28 year old kid, we're going to give him a line of credit based on, you know what I mean? Like I have so many properties that it's not like I could ever pay them anyway with my salary from my job or whatever. So they, they very well might, uh, you know, it's part of a, it's a sales job for you a little bit to go in and show the banker that you're a good risk, that you're building a company and building an investment portfolio and that you have every intention to pay these things back because they're going to have awesome cash flow because of how you buy them, because of all that sort of stuff. And you have to know the banker speak debt service coverage ratios and things like that uh, uh, to talk to them a little bit. But um, yeah, you might. Now, you're going to have to shop around these days. I'm not saying this is going to be easy. In 2007, they'd give anybody who was breathing uh, a loan, which is kind of how we got into this mess. But now, if you have a, a good business model and you can prove good cash flow and things like that, and if you can get a introduction from another investor, which you know gets back to networking, if they can give you an in, you know, hey, Mr. Banker, you really should talk to Josh or Brandon because they're smart, they know what they're doing. Chances are, are pretty good that you they might give you a little feeder and test the waters with you. That's awesome. Yeah, and stop complaining about your salary on the radio show. Seriously, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're like really. Come I'm on. just saying, I, I, <laughs> I'm not going to go to the bank. I mean, like if I try to qualify for traditional financing now, they just look at how much debt I have compared oh, I to can't. income. Yeah, and they just it, laugh at it's, me. It's impossible. I've got uh, one of my old loans with uh, you know, a big bank. I won't mention them. Uh, and I was just trying to refinance it because the rates are so much lower. And the guy literally said to me, 
I can't put all your information in the computer because I just don't have that many slots to put it in. <laughs> and so therefore I'm shut out. You know, I was like, but I already have the loan with you. You know, I've been paying you for X years. <laughs> Why can't you just refine? I just don't have all the slots in my computer and it just shut down right there. That yep. was it. Small I banks. have too many properties, too many yep. properties. Yeah. 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 Small banks, uh, portfolio lenders, that stuff. So that's, that's, some great advice. Well, you had mentioned private lenders. So mm -hmm. why why would a private lender go ahead and lend on a buy and hold type of property? How does that work? Are you are you getting a thirty year loan from a private lender, no. or how how are you doing it? No, uh, generally our private lenders they'll they have to give me five years, and then there's a balloon in there, you know, at the end of five years. So it, it becomes due at the end of five years. And at that time, they can choose to either come back with us and, and roll the thing over again, or we can try and cash them out. Um, that's just one of my criteria that I have to have for me to buy properties with the lenders. And if that doesn't work with a particular person, that's fine. You know, I understand. Go on. We'll, we'll move on, do something else. But there are certain folks who are happy. Yeah, uh, with the interest rate you're paying, and it's better than what I can get putting it in a CD right now, which is what, 0.5%? You know, uh, they're happy to do that. So, what what kind of rates are you getting from private lenders? Uh, somewhere between eight and ten. Okay, it depends. And, and how long are you typically actually holding before you do a refi? Uh, five years. So you are actually holding for five years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do you do yeah. at the end there if you can't refinance out because the bank's not going to give you a loan? Let's say, like, you're going to have another exit strategy. Is that when you sell? Uh, well. I've always been able to find somebody to to refinance or you know there's always been a bank or somebody's willing to step in and do it. So I really haven't hit that problem uh, because the properties are nice and they cash flow well. Yep. And so and and you know I've never missed a payment. I've never not paid a lender. They're happy with us. They want to keep it going. The cash is coming in. I like the cash coming in from rents. They like the cash coming in from um you know they're uh, they're basically the bank. They like being the bank. Yeah. 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 Okay, so so you've got these 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 properties and obviously you're buying them at a at hopefully at a pretty decent discount. So mm -hmm. and and you had already said that you're buying them from the MLS. Mm -hmm. um, are are you know what what kind of discount are you getting off list price uh, on your typical property? What do you what kind of discount are you paying from their Yeah, are, are do these need repair, I guess, or or are they uh, yeah. ready to go? <laughs> I, I tend to buy distressed properties, and okay. distressed, you know, means they're either in a short sale or they've been foreclosed on, and and so usually, yes, they've been beaten up. Okay. Um, um, the the previous landlord uh, didn't manage it well, lost it, obviously, and so you know, all kinds of things happen there. They might be vacant now. If they've been foreclosed, they usually are vacant. Um, how much of a discount? Well, it depends on the realtor and how much they list it for. Um, honestly, sometimes these things have to sit on the market for a while for the bank or the seller or the realtor to come to reality as to what the actual price is going to be. Um, they're investment properties, and so you base the sales price on the amount of income that can be generated. You know, and that's that's where it starts off. And a lot of realtors have to be educated as to how that works. And uh, that just takes some time sometimes to do. So I really can't give you a hard and fast number. Sure. How much of a discount do I get? Yeah. Uh, but there is always a discount. And, you know, I've passed on tons of properties because they won't come down. You know, yeah. I'll let somebody else buy it. Yeah. No, right on. Yeah. You know, we, we put together this guide. Uh, it's, what is it? The Ultimate Agent's Guide to Working with Investors. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we wrote that. And we'll, we'll link to it in the show notes at, uh, what is it? Biggerpockets.com slash show 36. Uh, the the guide is designed to help educate agents for this uh, exact purpose be, be, right. because you know it it's uh, it's really amazing that that agents don't get that training as a requirement. I mean, they, they really don't. need they to don't. be better educated, particularly in working with investors, because yeah, you know, for them it's great. You know, you can build a better, stronger business if mm -hmm. you know how to do this stuff. And obviously, you know, stop wasting your time and energy and money. You know, uh, listing properties at really bad prices when they're right. not worth what what you're listing them for. Right, right. And I've actually I've talked to you know, given some talks to groups of realtors about working with investors and that sort of thing. So yeah, it's all about educating them because they don't learn it uh, through the realtor process. I always like to say, you know, I don't know what it's like in your state, but here in Tennessee, to get a license to cut hair, you have to take more hours than to get a license to sell real estate. So <laughs> <laughs> wow. you know. 
Yeah, that's, nice. that's crazy. Say, so I'm curious, you said, you know, you offer on, you know, a lot of properties and you might not get a lot of them. Do you, do you have like a ratio that you tend to get? You know, I hear some investors say, look at a hundred, you know, offer on 10 and you actually get one. Do you find that ratio about right? Or do you only offer on ones you're pretty sure you can get? Uh, I say at the beginning, it was kind of that way. Yeah. Make a lot of offers. You, you have to, some of the folks that we network with and even myself will say, you know, you need to go look at a hundred properties before you find one that you want to use because if you're new i mean that's just you got to get used to the market to what's out there to what's going on um yeah if you make 10 offers you probably will get one that's probably about the way it works um these days i'm i'm kind of i kind of know if it's going to work or not and so you know i'll make offers where i think it's going to work if i if i think it's it's probably not I, i might wait a little bit and see how it sits on the market for a while or or you know, somebody from will come and pick it up and pay too much, and I'll pick it up three years later when it gets <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, that's great. Well, what what about those properties that you make the offer on, and then it goes back on the market? Well, it stays on the market, obviously, mm-hmm. and, and nobody bites. What uh, you know? At, at what point in time do you do you go back and hit up that agent again and 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 put a put a secondary offer in? I've waited over a year uh, to go back. I've made an initial offer, uh, didn't get accepted. The owners, for whatever reason, didn't accept it. It sat on the market for over a year from that point and uh, came back and said, you know, here's my offer again, still stands, and was able to pick up the properties at that point. So it took time. So they had to. Yeah, they had to be educated as to what the price really was. Right on, right on. Was that the only time that you had come back on an offer? Uh, on a property that that sat or or has that no no I went uh, on another one a bank uh, had foreclosed on a property uh, and I went out and talked to the bank and said look you know I'll give you X dollars for this particular property and they decided they wanted to list it uh, on the market they spent eight months listing setting this thing on the market I eventually picked it up from them for less than what I had initially offered them yeah. nice. Nice. Yeah. And, you know, so, you know, they had to learn the hard way. And that bank's not even around anymore. That bank actually got foreclosed on. Nice. Uh, so, awesome. You know, they made some pretty bad deals uh, That's great. in there and uh, obviously didn't learn uh, from their mistakes. So, so, do you have a database? Do you track those properties that, that you're interested in and just kind of watch them to see when they go? Or, or is it kind of, if it kind of comes back somehow, you run across it again, then, then it, it's at the front of your mind? I don't really have a database. Uh, I kind of just have a folder where I'll put the uh, maybe a printout from an MLS listing in, and you know every once in a while I'll just flip through it uh, and see. Or a lot of times, you know, the the realtors will play their little games where they'll drop the price a hundred dollars or <laughs> or put it back on the market, and so it'll pop back up, and I'll see it again, and it'll be like, oh, well, this thing's still on the market. Let me go go gotcha. check it out. Or driving around, I'll see the sign still in the yard, you know, that sort of thing, and and it'll pop in my mind that I need to check that out again. Right on, right on. And, and so what, what neighborhoods are you buying in? Are you buying in a you know, middle class, upper middle? You know, what, what are you looking at? Uh, we generally are going to uh, buy in um, uh, better neighborhoods. Uh, I'm generally stay in Midtown Memphis, uh, and I know you guys don't know where that is, but it's a kind of a uh, it's a trendy area. A lot of folks want to live there. I like to buy neighborhoods where people want to live, not where they have to live. Uh, and so my tenants, my typical tenant is a young urban professional tenant. Oh, okay. Uh, and that's who I'm going to get They They care about their credit and they want their security deposit back. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's, that's going to be my typical tenant. Um, I've got, I invest in areas where the trendy restaurants are, where the trendy shops are, you know, that sort of thing. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, so so you you know mid Midtown Memphis is mm-hmm. is a little different than like Midtown Montesano. There's more than one traffic light there, right? <laughs> yes, yes, there okay. are dozens. Yes, oh, okay. yeah, lots of them. <laughs> what, <laughs> what kind of what kind of price range are these are these houses in? Uh, Midtown Memphis has got houses all the way from you know you can buy a a beat up. Thirty thousand dollar house to you know some of the houses in Midtown are one point five million dollars. Cool. You know, obviously one point five million dollar house, you're not going to get that cash flow. But the thirty thousand dollar one with a little bit of fix up, yeah, you might be able to get that. 
Um, you're, it, it's harder to find properties in those types of areas because the values tend to be higher and there's tends to be more investors chasing them a little bit. Um, you're talking the lower, the lower higher area. end, higher end areas. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, the values are just higher and so it's harder to make those cash flow because the values are higher, yep. uh, simply got to pay more for them. And it's, it, you know, that can make it a little tougher to find the deal. And so you really have to stay on top of it. Uh, when, so, you know, if something comes on the market and it's a deal, man, you've got to jump on it quick because somebody else is going to get it too. You know, everybody else is out there looking for that too. So if you've got your, your money, your commercial financing, all that stuff in place, you got to have that stuff ready to go. So you can make that offer maybe within 24 hours uh, uh, to go. Uh, I can remember a couple years ago, I went to look at a property at 10 o'clock in the morning. By noon, I told my wife, you know, she's the realtor. Uh, I said, you know, hey, let's make an offer on that. We called the realtor. She said, oh, it's already under contract. You know, and it had just popped up at 8 o'clock the night before. So, I mean, it, you know, it was gone. It just, if it's priced right, it's going to go. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. You, you said your wife's a realtor? Yes, she's actually a real estate broker. She's a broker. Okay, mm-hmm. and and uh, so how does obviously I'm assuming there's some some uh, serious benefit to having the the license under your purview uh, between you and your wife. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know we everything's in house. We don't have other realtors working for us. Uh, we don't manage other folks' properties. Uh, the real estate brokerage is basically allows us access to the MLS. We can we can see it. You know, on all our own time. We don't have to have another realtor involved and obviously whenever we uh purchase something the seller plays commission here in tennessee so you know we get she gets some commission from when we buy a property gotcha and why why would somebody go uh, and get a brokerage license versus just your uh agent license uh more commission obviously is one yeah reason. more commission uh and and if you're just an agent then you have to hang your broker you have to hang your license with a broker somewhere and depending on the broker i mean they're going to make the rules has to well do you have to attend sales meetings do you have to attend this you know i need you to have so much in sales etc 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 it's just there are brokers out there who will work with investors but sometimes they can be few and far between and hard to find but uh they're out there when when you offer on a property, then do you have to disclose that your wife is a is an agent or broker? You know, like there's some disclosure rules, but how does that work for a married couple? Uh, if I'm just making the offer initially, we don't. I don't have to disclose. I'll just hand. I have a one page contract that I that I use, and I'll just uh, give that out. Eventually, yes. Uh, you know, she's representing me, so yes, all the disclosures will come. But initially. Uh, right off the top, no. And was that was that uh, at some point? Obviously, your wife went and picked up picked up the license. So mm-hmm. you know, previous to that, um, you know, I, I guess what kind of advice would you have for for uh, folks listening in terms of you know when's maybe a good time to think about getting that license and and you know if is it you know at what point is it a good time to go from being an agent hanging your uh, shingle with somebody else to to hang, hanging your own shingle. It's hard to say. Yeah, it is hard to say. I guess it's going to depend on the investor and what they want to do, uh, and just how you know. Do they want to keep things in house, or do they mind uh, hanging up their license with somebody else? Um, you do take on a little more liability, of course, being a broker. I mean, it all is going to fall on you. Whereas if you're hanging with another broker, it's going to fall on the other broker. Um, and there's a few more costs, more liability insurance, more uh, uh, classes you have to take, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to keep that thing up. It's just going to depend on how you want to structure your business or how you want to run things. It's, it's worked out for us very well because we just like to keep things in-house and uh, uh, close to what we're doing. Right on. Right that on. makes sense to y'all. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely, definitely. All right, so let, let's, let's move to uh, a little con- – Controversy, so to Uh-oh. speak, a little uh-huh. controversy here. Uh, slumlords, yeah, slumlords. yeah, slumlords. They're out there. There's plenty of them. Hopefully, you are not one. I'm assuming you are not. I hope not. I hope not. No, uh, no. I, I, uh, uh, you, you know, I'd, l- I'd like to talk about what, what, what makes somebody a slumlord. Well, you know, you kind of have to think what's a s- typically a slumlord. Um, you know, it's someone I think who is not fixing up their properties or lets them go into disrepair or just kind of neglects their tenants. 
I think. Um, why do they do that? Well, who knows? It could be many things. I mean, I think there are, yes, a couple folks out there who the general public might think some lord sitting back smoking their cigars on piles of money and just counting their change. But I think mostly it's most folks who would get accused of being slumlords, and you guys may agree or not here, I think it's folks who get in trouble somehow, and, and eventually their properties end up being distressed, and folks like me pick them up. They haven't learned how to manage tenants. They haven't learned how to screen tenants. They haven't had enough cash flow. Something happens, and they get in trouble. Yeah. In other and, words, and the they property, haven't spent enough time on bigger pockets. <laughs> yeah. Yes, they haven't learned enough, and, and the cash flow starts to crunch, uh, suddenly they can't make the repairs and that's just a, that's a pyramid that'll just start to build if you let a re- few repairs go and then it'll just get worse and worse and worse and then your good tenants will leave uh, you'll try to do anything to fill them you'll start filling them with bad tenants and that just it just leads down a spiral and I think honestly that's a lot of folks what happens uh, is why they would get called a slumlord they get in over their heads and then thirdly I think People just get tired of it and say, you know, I'm just tired of dealing with this. I don't want to, don't call me ever again. You know, just pay, your your rent's cheap. Don't call me. I'm not fixing it. I'm just tired of dealing with it. And uh, if I can ever sell these, I would, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of that. I I also think, you know, there there certainly are those people who say, yeah, well, you know what, I'm going to buy a property and, you know. Ah, that doesn't need paint. Who cares? You know, yeah, cares, yeah. you know I, I think a lot of that is is an attitude. Um, I, I, you know, who knows what the percentages are, but but oh, I, yeah. I I think the the guy who just says screw it, you know, they don't have respect for their tenants and they could care less, and so right. they, you know, they're they're low lives or whatever. You know, they they got a roof on their head, they should be happy. You know, though I mean, those are the really bad ones. I th- I think the the folks who kind of find themselves in trouble. You know, obviously they're hopefully doing it unintentionally, and if they have right. the ability to, would would do better by their tenants. But you know, in the end, everybody kind of they all give a bad name to to those people who are not slumlords, right? They they do. Uh, I think people don't realize just you know, landlording is not the easiest thing in the world to do. I mean, it's it's. Uh, a lot of uh, these so-called gurus out there will tell folks, hey, it's easy. You know, you can do it from Hawaii sitting on the beach. And it's, you know, it, it's not that easy. I see a lot of out-of-state investors here coming in from Seattle, Australia, wherever. And I'm just like wondering, how the heck are you guys going to manage this from, you know, the other hemisphere? And I honestly pick up a lot of properties from folks from California, uh, Seattle, whatnot, who have bought here, who are trying to manage it from the West Coast. And, you know, it's a lot harder than it, than you think it is. Yeah, I, m- I remember you wrote a post a couple months ago called, like, uh, so you're a slumlord, how to respond. And the whole oh, idea yeah. was, yeah, every time, because I, I have the same thing that you do, is whenever somebody asks me what I do, I say, well, I'm an investor. They always make right. that joke every time. Oh, you're a they slumlord. Do. Yep. They do. It's it's just associated with, with landlords, unfortunately. And, and. I, I don't know how we got such a bad name, uh, but we did. And, you know, I try really hard not to do it, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to try to keep things up nice and, uh, and, and, you know, respond to tenant issues. Yeah. And, and I think that's, you know, that's really the goal of, of what I've been working on for, for almost nine years now with, yeah. with bigger pockets is, you know, can we, you know, can we do something? Can we work as a community together to, to change not only the way that investors learn, you know, you know, kind of getting rid of the old, you know, get rich quick, you know, guru mm-hmm. mentality and moving towards more of a community base, working with local, you know, mentors and, and, and people, but also to, you know, trying to, to change the perception of, of real estate investors and, and, mm-hmm. you know, change the way that they think about themselves as well. Because I, I think, you know, take, take like bandit signs, for example, you know, uh-huh. it's, it's a tactic that, yeah, you know, the gurus push on everybody, and and that are it's really popular, and frankly, it's kind of effective. But you know, mm-hmm. in the end, I'll argue every day of the week that it's really bad for you personally as a brand, and it's really bad for investors as a group. You know, these mm-hmm. things are are bad for our neighborhoods. They don't look good. You know, they may work, but there's other ways to do it. So I, I, right. I think if we kind of all work together in terms of how can we better the set of people that we're a part of. Um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, that's how it's going to change. It's just oh, yeah. going to take time. Mm-hmm. It's, it's education. Like we were talking about, uh, with the realtors earlier. Uh, and it's just showing folks 
that, uh, you know, hey, we're not all bad. Yeah, definitely. All right. Um, I want to move on to a, another topic. You know, I know a lot of people that listen to the show are either mm -hmm. not investors yet but want to be, or maybe they own one property or two properties. You know, they're small-time mm -hmm. do-it-yourself landlords. I, I, I want to get in kind of a some how-to questions, I guess, on, on how you sure. actually manage properties. Uh, so why don't we, I guess, why don't we start out at the very beginning. How do you find good tenants? Like, how do you advertise? How do you, you know, get the right tenant in there? Mm -hmm. um, all of our advertisements are done through our websites and uh, web-based uh, media. Uh, you know, I've got my own website, uh, and that's that puts it up there. We have a property management software that we have purchased and used. Uh, which kind of automatically generates the ads and it puts it automatically on Craigslist and several others out there. That is how we get and find tenants. We do not even put signs in the yards anymore. Um, we, uh, it's all internet based. Uh, as I said, you know, we, we generally have a young urban professional tenant. They're going to be online. They're going to be with their smartphones. That's how they're finding their information. And so that's how yep. we're trying to connect with them. Now in other types of, of markets, you're definitely going to have to put signs in the yard. So I'm not saying signs are bad, uh, you know, for rent signs. Um, it just depends on your market. But that's how we find them. Everything's internet based for us. Yeah, I, I find that Craigslist nowadays, like just in the last two years or so of my market, Craigslist has completely overtaken any other form of advertising that we're doing. Like, oh, the, it's it's phenomenal. It, it is. It's in, and it's awesome because it's free. Like our our mm -hmm. local newspaper is a hundred and. I think it's fairly cheap for a newspaper, but it's $140 a month or something. And, oh, our uh, newspaper is outrageously expensive. Nobody reads it. What's the newspaper? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's Commercial Appeal. Yeah. Uh, to put an ad in that thing is really expensive. I don't even remember what it is because we haven't done it in nine years. Yep. So um, yeah. we, we do use, uh, I, since you brought up print media, we do use, there's a local free paper here that certain cities have. You know, they put them around, you know, everywhere. Uh, we do use that because a lot of the, you know, that paper gets picked up and read by our tenant base quite a bit. And so we will put an ad in there, which they, which also goes on to back page. There's a Memphis back page. It also goes up there and, and that's, that site brings us some good traffic as well. Yeah. Yeah. I found back page just wasn't very effective, but Craigslist certainly is a, uh, is a great resource for finding tenants. It, it's just going to depend on the market and where yeah. you are and what folks do. And you're going to have to try several different things to find what works for you. Yeah. And I, I, I think, you know, lower end tenants, lower income properties, typically the, the signs are, are going to be your best bet. Yes, they you will. Know, and as you rise up uh, amongst the income class, you're going to uh, find uh, that online media certainly is probably your, your best bet. Right. And, and even, but even in the higher income areas, uh, you know, folks are going to be driving around looking because they might want a particular school. And so they're going to be looking, driving around in that school district. And that's going to be the driver for them is finding something in that particular school district. So signs still in the higher neighborhoods work. Well, I, I tell you, uh, you know, Zillow actually just came out and I, I haven't even tested it yet, but, uh, they just announced that they have mapping of school districts now on their wow. site, which, you know, that's phenomenal. I, I think that's going to be really valuable for for uh, folks looking to rent in, in you know different mm -hmm. districts and and for people buying as well. So yeah. you know, there's a, there's a great uh, quick tip for you. Yeah. I snuck it's, it in there. It's you know. a big <laughs> it's a big driver for uh, people with families, you know, with kids schools. I mean, my tenants generally don't have kids, so that's not a big, a big issue. Uh, but, but for those families that are moving into an area and, uh, you know, with kids, schools are going to drive it and that's, that's what they're going to look for. Cool. And so what, what's your, uh, screening process? Well, uh, I'm going to look for generally about four things. Uh, you know, they ha everybody has to fill out an application. Everybody has to pay the application fee, hands down. Yeah, you know, there's no no getting around that. And that's online, right? Not a paper app. Or? It's it's we could do either, but most of it's online. Yeah, okay. it comes goes through our website. Uh, but for those who, for whatever reason, can't get online, we can give them a paper one. No big deal. But you know, basically, we're looking for income to pay rent. I want to see that you've got enough income coming in to pay rent and cover your bills and have food and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I don't want any evictions. You know, no evictions. Period. Uh, I want fairly decent credit. Um, you What's know, fairly I want, decent. 
Uh, six hundreds and up. You know, that's what we're generally looking at here. We, we can go a little lower depending, uh, but it's, you know, depending on your situation. Uh, we just really want to see that you're going to pay your bills and that you have paid your bills. Yep. Um, especially things like utility bills. You know, if you're not paying those and they're coming after you. Uh, you're not going to pay me either. So, you know, that's what we're looking for. I always look Uh, to the car loan. If people don't pay their car loan, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. There's, because that's like the last thing somebody wants to get rid of is their car because that's like their life. Right. Or the cable bill, you know. I mean, if if cable's gone, then, you know, it's it's bad. (laughs) Uh, But other things, you know, that you may not think about, but but neatness counts, manners count, and not lying to me is a big thing. Yeah. Uh, if you lie to me on an application, I find it, you're done. You know, yeah. you're, you're just out the door right there. You know, we ask, you know, have you been in bankruptcy? And, and you know, tell me the truth. I've worked with people who've been in bankruptcy. Hey, w- one of my best tenants was a guy who went bankrupt because cancer bankrupted him. Uh, you know, and, and he was great. So yeah, I can work with you as long as you're honest with me up front and you're not a jerk. I mean, yeah. if you come off, uh, you know, being a jerk, I'm not going to let you in my property because guess what you're going to be once I let you in? <laughs> Even a bigger jerk. So, you know, manners, neatness, you know, if your car is full of trash and all that, you know, it's, it, 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 your apartment's going to be all full of trash. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think, I think, uh, most people are aware of, of the, uh, the protected classes, you know, oh, yes. race, age, gender, that kind of stuff. But, you know, as, as a landlord, you can discriminate against, you know, dirty pigs, slobs. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, you dirty can is not a protected class. Yeah, it is not a dirty is not a protected class. Smokers, you don't have to yeah. let smokers in. Uh, we've talked about that on the blog before. Uh, I know a landlord who doesn't allow folks with motorcycles. Uh, oh. He says the motorcycle is going to end up on my living room, dripping carpet in January, <laughs> or dripping oil on the carpet in January. You know, that's and so no motorcycles. I just don't allow tenants that have them. Yeah. Uh, no landscapers. Because really? they're just dirty. dirty. I mean, <laughs> they're just going to be filled with mud. I've had a couple of roofers, and every roofer uh, is extremely dirty on the walls because they're with uh, their hands are all covered in yeah, roofing material. Black, yeah. Yep, mm-hmm. and they cover the walls in dirt. It happens. I've had like three of them just like that. Great. Yeah, I should Great. make all the roofers should, in the yeah. world. They're going to hate us now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was just thinking and I should make that. A, yeah, maybe I'll make that a requirement. <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't me that bans them. It was other folks. Other <laughs> folks. Well, well, what other? I mean, what other non-protected things uh, have you have you uh, um, uh, screened out? Uh, you know, obviously drugs are one. I mean, if you've, if you've got, Oh, come on, Kevin, uh, you know, it (laughs) depends. No, 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 no. You know, if we see, uh, you know, serious convictions in the past, uh, you know, criminals, I mean, crime, that's one, you know, I mean, criminals are not a protected class. Um, you know, obviously a traffic ticket or something minor a long time ago, we can work with you, but I mean, I just don't want to see, I just don't want all those problems that are going to come with that, especially if you've been dealing. I mean, you know, that's, that's just one. Uh, uh-uh, uh, uh-uh. it'll drive your other tenants away. I'm so. Oh, what about what about like DWIs or DUIs? Uh, you know, that's gonna kind of look at you. You'll be able to see if they make poor decisions mm-hmm. when you pull their credit. You know, is the was the DUI a poor decision along with a bunch of other things? Uh, like they don't pay their bills and they're just doing other dumb things. Or was the DUI a one-time thing? The guy made a mistake and he really kind of needs a chance. You can kind of see it when you get the whole picture and, and, you're, and you're screening everybody gotcha. uh, out that way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you've been doing this a while. You're, you're obviously very skilled at it. Um, the, you know, I, I think one of the big problems that newer landlords face – uh, particularly as we approach the uh, time of year that we're approaching now – in, in most of the country, at least, is, you know, November, October, December, mm-hmm. January, February, it gets harder to rent your apartment. It gets harder to rent your house out. Uh, people aren't looking as much. And I, I think oftentimes there's that level of compromise that happens. Well, you know, if I can't get them in now, uh, you know, I'm going to have to wait till February. What, mm-hmm. you know, what can you tell the listeners to, to maybe help uh, alleviate that? Do you have any advice for, what they can do, and I would say, just drop the rent and and find you know find a better class of, of customer. But uh, what would you right? Say? That's the main thing. If a property's not renting, a lot of times it's because of the price, and you need to come down a little bit on the price and see if you start to get some more hits. I, I know it's painful to have it sitting there vacant, but 
don't drop your standards just to get somebody in there. You're not going to make any money. On the back end, you're going to end up paying a lot more than what you're going to collect in rent. I mean, we've We've tried and learned the hard way of going down that road. Oh, yeah, me uh, too. <laughs> yeah. You, really you, bad. Folks, just stick it out a little bit. If you can get past Christmas, people will start looking. There are people, people are moving to towns, ch- changing jobs. There's all kinds of things. Yeah, there's not as many as May and June, but they're out there. And, and if you have a nice place in a decent area at a good price, it's going to rent eventually. So just stick to your guns. Yeah, that's great. That's and I know a, a lot of landlords, um, you know, advocate, you know, when you get, actually sign a lease with a tenant, structure that lease so it doesn't end in December, January or November, December, January. Uh, you know, if that means offering a, you know, an eight month lease instead of a 12 month because you don't want it to end at the wrong time. Um, and I know like for me, I always go into like blitz mode in October, November. And I like, I ramp up my marketing like crazy to make sure everything's full by yeah. November 1st because yeah, nothing will rent from November 1st to January 31st in my area. Just nothing. It's 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 difficult. I, I can't say nothing will rent here. Obviously, we're in a slightly different market because it, it will rent, but it is certainly more difficult. Uh, and, and yes, yeah, so we have used – that's one trick. Um, you know, maybe do a six-month lease so that it ends in June. Um, you know, or, or if you can negotiate a 14-month or a 15-month or whatever, you know, if the tenant's willing to do that. Then yeah, try to try to extend them uh, out so that uh, your vacancy comes up when the market is high. Yeah, nice. How do you collect rent? Do you collect rent uh, online through one of these online rent payment companies, or uh, what, what do you use? Our property management software uh, uh, has a portal where folks can pay their rent online, and about seventy uh, percent of them do that. What do you uh, use? What software? Uh, we use Appfolio. Appfolio, okay. I also, I just started using it on my website, and it's really, really cool. So Yes, it is, uh, especially talking about the ads on Craigslist that we did before. It generates those. It makes them pretty. It's nice. It, it's, it's really, I'll give them a little plug. It's a nice uh, thing. Uh, you new folks out there are not going to need that right away, but as you build your business, that's something you're going to want to think about. And, and um, we have a we have a list, um, and we'll we'll point to it in the show notes as well at biggerpockets.com/show36. Of uh, it's a whole list of a handful of of different online rent uh, mm-hmm. uh, online uh, property management software platforms like Appfolio. Uh, so make sure to check that out on the show notes at biggerpockets.com/show36, and you can do your own research on that. But uh, yeah. obviously, you just got two plugs to have folio. So. Yeah, and shop around. <laughs> we, we shopped around all of them, uh, um, or a lot of them, but uh, we found that you know that was the one that worked the best for us. And you're just going to have to see what works for you. Before that, we used a service called ClearNow. If you're not that big, uh, you can use them. Uh, obviously, they take a little cut out of your rent, but it's so worth it because it deposits it's right in your checking account. You don't have to go to the mailbox. You don't have to go banging on doors or anything like that. Boom, it's right there. And of course... Uh, my tenant base is going to like that. They're used to paying things online. They're used to paying with you know debit cards and things like that. They don't have checkbooks anymore. They don't have stamps. You know what's a stamp? You know, we don't know what that is. And so everything's done online. The more we can get to that, the better for us. But uh, we still, like I said, it's about seventy percent that pay online. Uh, the rest is check. They they mail them to us. I don't go banging on doors uh, looking for rent. Yeah, yeah, right on. Um, what what about cash flow? So you know I I. I'm I'm a guy of of the mindset that uh, cash flow means you're you're making a profit every single month, you know, mm-hmm. barring the uh, the capex that you actually plan for ahead of time, mm-hmm. and and so when when you're uh, plotting ahead for uh, you know a purchase, you're obviously keeping in mind all the expenses that come with a rental property, not not the ones that you know. Sorry to rip on agents here, uh, but uh, the vast majority of agents will tell investors, you know, it's your uh, it's your rent minus your mortgage. <laughs> right, right. That is, that is that is not cash flow. So, no. You know, do, you know, what's what's your theory on cash flow? Will you buy a property that that's quote break even, or or uh, or do you only aim for a specific amount per door? How do you work it? No, I will not buy a property that's break even because I can tell you it won't be break even for long. Uh, something's going to break. Something's going to happen that it will not be break even. Uh, my my standard is I look for about one hundred and fifty dollars positive cash flow per month per unit. 
So if it's a duplex, that's $300 positive cash flow uh, per month. And that's on top of everything. You know, that's your principal interest, taxes, insurance, uh, about 10% vacancy credit thrown in there, 10 to 12% repairs, and then trying to put a little bit of a uh, reserve fund away for future. You know, you got to repair the roof at some point, your condenser is going to go, all of those sort of things. So you got to put a little bit of a reserve away as well. What about property management? Since you guys are managing, are you assuming the uh, management fee of, say, 10% a month on, on top of that? Because you got to pay yourself. Yeah, yeah. We kind of throw that in there a little bit as well. Um, not as much when we first started out, but uh, now as we've gotten a little wiser and, and structured things a little differently, yeah, uh, we try to plug that in there. Uh, because as you get larger, you can't do it all yourself. And right. you know, we, we've had to hire a couple of folks as well to help us out. Uh, and so they've got to get paid somehow. Well, it comes out of that uh, so what, cash flow. What What's the best way for for newer folks to to plan for you know the, the expenses? You know, I, again, I I think that's probably one of the biggest errors that we see people making is mm-hmm. they they have the wrong assumptions about what it actually costs to be a landlord, and that's where they screw up. And you know, it, it happens when they buy they over they buy they overpay because they don't know what they think the rent. Is going to be covered by the mortgage, and right. uh, that's that's it. That's the end of the story. Yeah, you know, they get bad advice. Uh, people, they're told, well, you know, you need to just cover your mortgage, or, you know, but there's also taxes, there's insurance, and and the repairs. Yeah, the the average that everybody likes to use is ten percent of your gross income. So if your rent is six hundred dollars, you can expect to pay sixty dollars a month in repairs. Now you may not do it every month, but uh, say in May, you know something's going to break, and you're going to have to use those five accumulated months, uh, that three hundred dollars, uh, to fix something. Uh, trust me, it's going to come. And and I would even probably, I've lately been going up to twelve, fifteen percent, trying to budget that in uh, because you know stuff breaks a lot. Yeah, <laughs> and and uh, not every tenant is going to take as good care of stuff as it is. Like you would if it was your own. I mean, you know, things break, and and you've just got to be ready for that. You've also got to have reserves too. That's that's key as well. Have some cash in the bank. Yeah. What does that look like? How many? You know, I mean, and I'm guessing that that'll depend on the the size of the property, the purchase price. But yeah, you know, what would you recommend in terms of reserves for folks? Uh, you know, it's just going to depend on on how how big the property is, and and uh, but you should you know. You should at least have an emergency fund of several thousand dollars, at least. If you've got one property, you know, put five to ten thousand dollars aside. Because if if something happens, uh, you know, if there's a storm and it blows your roof off, well, I mean, you're going to have a huge deductible to put it back on. Uh, you know, and stuff happens. I mean, trees fall on properties. You know, you just never know. You're taking the gamble if you don't have some funds put aside. I, I have a triplex that we, we saved up like $9,000 for like the emergency fund and we wiped the entire thing out in one month. I mean, 100% of it in one month just because we had two vacancies and eviction and two remodels because the units oh, yeah. were destroyed. Yeah, And, and that's, that's the other thing people don't realize is the turnover kills you, um, yep. especially if they tear up the unit. Yep. Um, so, I mean, the key is to A, get long-term tenants if you can, B, get your, if you can't, get your properties back in almost as good condition as what they went out. Because the turnover, if you have to constantly rehab these things every year, uh, fresh paint, redo the floors, you know, yada, 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 the whole thing, your cash flow is going to get killed. Yep. How do you do that? How do I do, well, make how sure does, I get them back? How does somebody, yeah, how does somebody get, get a property back in as good or close to as good a condition as possible? Don't rent to landscapers, I know. Right. <laughs> right. It goes back to the tenant screening we talked about um, and, and getting a tenant that cares about their credit and uh, not getting that dinged and getting somebody who actually wants their security deposit back and somebody who's neat and and has manners and all that sort of thing is probably going to take care of your property fairly well. Yeah. And that just shows Plus managing why. we 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 manage it when when they tell us they're going to move out, boom, we send them a form. Here's all the things you've got to do. Uh the fridge has got to be clean, the stove has got to be cleaned, uh with prices next to them that yep. says if we have to clean the fridge, it's $50. Uh you know, if I have to take a fork out of the drawer, it's $10. 
you know, if I have to put a light bulb in, it's ten dollars. So we send them that list, and uh, you know, this is what if you want to get your security deposit back, this is what you got to do. And a lot of times we get it back in pretty dang good condition. We just did. We just started that. We got that form that you know that says the price for everything, and mm-hmm. it's hard to tell you know how much it's improving. But the last two people that moved out with that form cleaned spotless because oh, I think yeah. there's something about that when they see the number that it's ten bucks to replace a light bulb. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden, yeah. then they start to, uh, you know, think, oh, that's coming out of my wallet. Yeah, so. and, you, you know, you'll never get them back perfect. There's always yeah. normal wear and tear. You're going to have to touch up a little paint and whatnot. But, you know, it's it's not hundreds or thousands of dollars worth of repairs that you have to go in and fix. Yeah, uh, You can almost re-rent them instantly, which is what you want. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, well, let's let's kind of move on to to the next uh, next section here, and we're we're gonna try and speed it up a little bit because this this is looking like this is gonna be a pretty long show here, uh, which is great because there's a ton of ton of great stuff here. Um, for for you at least, what's I guess what's the point of the cash flow? You know, is this live uh, live off the cash flow, say for for future purchases, or is it you using it to pay down loans? What what are you doing? Uh, you know, it's, it's living uh, and building reserves and everything else. I mean, the cash flow is our salary, pretty much. I mean, that's, that's how we put food on our table, put gas on the car, uh, buy an occasional luxury, uh, pay our mortgage payment uh, on my house and that sort of thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's what we live on and it's what we use to invest further in the business. Uh, to make improvements, uh, to to put a little bit down, perhaps on buying another property. Well, well, let me let me ask you this. So, you're you're what we would call a pretty successful landlord, you know, and 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 so, uh, you know, I I think I really want to harp on this because you know you're successful. You're living off your business. You've created this mm-hmm. business that you and your family survives off of and does you know hopefully fairly well with. But you know you're you're not spending you know. Uh, uh, six months out of the year in Tahiti right. and buying, you know, ten Mercedes and and blinging it up. I mean, you're, you know, the 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 perception of this, you know, landlord is mm-hmm. as rich man. Um, what, what what's your theory on that? Uh, you know, it kind of gets back to that slumlord discussion we had. You know, the, they all perceive us as we go home, light up a cigar, and then sit on my piles of cash like Scrooge <laughs> McDuck or something. I don't, Scrooge I don't know. Scrooge McDuck, I love that guy. Uh huh. You know, and, and I don't know where that perception came from, but it, yeah, you're paying me six, eight hundred dollars a month in rent, but you know, I'm, a lot of that's going back out. I've got to pay the bank. I've got to pay the bank on the first. There's no calling the bank and going, oh well, I'm a little late. You know, my cat died or whatever. You know, <laughs> I have got to pay them on the first, or they are going to take the property from me. I've got to pay the city taxes and the county taxes. There's no stopping that insurance and you know when you call me about your toilet uh leaking or this is broke or that's broke that's where the money comes from i got to cut the grass i got to keep the you know the place painted and looking good uh i got to pay somebody to pick up the trash all of these things add up uh to where i'm really not bringing home eight hundred dollars a month that you're paying me you know the majority of that is going back out to keep a roof over your head that's nice and habitable in some place you want to live in. Yeah. Uh, I get a little bit extra. Um, I can eat a pizza every once in a while, or, or you know, uh, you know, drink a good beer every once in a while. Maybe take a vacation uh, every once in a while. But I'm certainly not sitting in Hawaii six months out of the year. Yeah. Uh, as as much as I'd like to be. Yeah. You know, maybe that that's the goal <laughs> yeah. at some point. But uh, right now we're still building our business. Yeah. Uh, you know, our goal eventually would be to replace us more and more as more and more cash flow comes in, yeah. replace us with managers, and then maybe uh, we can go and sit in Hawaii at some point. And I and I wanted to raise that just because again, I I think there's there's a lot of people out there that are selling that dream. That, oh yeah. It, and and I really you know if anything if we can do anything with what I what Bigger Pockets is and does and the show is, I want it to be about reality. And that's re- cold reality right there. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, if you want to get rich, you can get rich with real estate. It takes it's a lot time of work. And it's it's a, takes a lot of time. Work. It's a lot of work. The, the best thing you get from being on your own and getting into real estate is flexibility. You get your time and, and you get a flexible schedule. Uh, you know, you can work at two in the morning if you want to or 10 in the morning or whenever. But 
the bad part is it's all on you. I mean, it's it's all falling on you, especially in the beginning. You know, if you don't when you don't have any help, you know, if somebody calls, hey, my toilet's leaking, you got to go over there and fix it. You know, or uh, you know, you got to cut the grass, you got to do all of these things to keep that up, and uh, it's it's hard, it's time consuming, and uh, it takes a lot of it takes a lot of funds sometimes. Yeah. So would you? What would you say then is like the worst part about being a landlord? Uh, the fact that it's all on you, uh, it, it, it all comes back to you. I mean, if you're going to sink or swim, it's all on you and how you've done your business. Um, that's, I think the hardest part of it. Sometimes you can feel rather alone out there, uh, uh working on these things, uh, keeping it up. And, you know, that's why it's nice to, to network with other folks, other landlords on bigger pockets or whatever, cause you, you don't feel so alone. Somebody yeah. else is having the same problems you are. Yeah. No, it's a thousand percent true. I talked to somebody yesterday and they said every time they talk to somebody about real estate in their life, they just kind of look at them like they're greedy. And I feel the same way sometimes. Like I talk to my family and friends about it and Mm -hmm. they just kind of, you know, their eyes gloss over and they just think, oh, there's Brandon being greedy. People don't get it. Stop bragging, you guys. (laughs) Come on. Yeah, that's exactly what people think. And uh, People don't get it. And, And, you know, one of the things a lot of folks say about, you know, if you want to get into real estate is go talk to other folks who are into real estate. Don't talk to, you know, Uncle John who, you know, uh, works for the government or something because they're going to tell you real estate's bad. You know, da, 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 it's, you know, that's not true. You need to find somebody who's actually in real estate and uh, uh, will give you the, the straight dope on what's going on. Yeah. 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 And it, it's funny. People always say to me over the years, they're like, well, how's bigger buckets? How's your business? You know, the market's real crappy. You know, what's, what's going on? I said, listen, no matter what, there are people who are buying properties. If the market's yeah. great, people, everybody's jumping in thinking, hey, I'm going to be a landlord. When the market turns, most of those people get out of the business and mm-hmm. sell their properties to real investors, guys like you guys who, who have a background, who work their butts off to do it and aren't there trying to gamble and bet on appreciation and other right, things. Right. So, yeah. you know, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, so you mentioned networking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I believe, uh, quote, uh, tell me if I'm wrong here, you, you're the VP of a, of a local uh, real estate club. Um, how, how did how'd you get into that? Why did you get into that? And, and let's really quickly try and fly through this whole RIA sure. thing and, and the value sure. of it. So t- tell us yeah. a little bit about that really quick. Well, yeah, I was a past president and vice president of our local RIA, which is the Memphis Investors Group. Uh, and I've been involved with them for 10 years. Um, how did I get into them? I just was looking for help, looking for other folks to talk about uh, on real estate. And you start Googling things, you start looking around, and you find uh, these clubs. Uh, and so I went and uh, kept going and signed up and became a member, and I've been been going ever since. It's been great. Um, the biggest thing about going, at least to my club, was learning, learning from other investors out there who had done it. And so I didn't make the same mistakes that they had made. I've, I've got a good friend here who says, you know, if you don't do it, you're going to have a bunch of seminars. He specifically says seminar. And we all know what a seminar is. You know, you go to these gurus, you pay thousands of dollars to take their seminar. Well, even if you don't do that, you're still going to pay thousands of dollars for seminars because you're going to let in a bad tenant, you're going to buy a property wrong, and you're going to end up paying thousands of dollars to learn that lesson the hard way instead of going to a local RIA group and, and, and hearing another more experienced investor tell you, here's how you screen tenants. You know, here's how you buy properties right or whatever it happens to be. Um, and so that's kind of how I got into it. And uh, now I like to give back and that's why I stay with it. I like to, to teach and give back to the new folks coming in. So there's obviously good clubs and there's, there's certainly uh, quite a few bad ones out there. Mm-hmm. How, there are. How, how, how can somebody um, avoid the bad ones? I guess you, you just kind of got to go and, See if it's just a big fat pitch fest, and if yeah, you know they're not going to have up a sign that says you know we're a bad club. Yeah, um, you know be careful, and they're not going to have their red flags out. But there certainly are, I think, things you can look for, and it's just going to take a little bit of time on your part to go and feel them out. I think uh, if you go and it's always a sales pitch, somebody's always trying to sell you something, uh, or somebody's always trying to sell you in particular their particular properties. Red flag, red flag. You know, yeah. uh, be be careful. Um, you know, not saying that it's a bad club. It could be very good. You know, there are there are 
lots of privately owned RIAs out there that are fine. Uh, I've been to several, and they're good clubs. Ours is a nonprofit, so you know maybe that'll make a difference to you, nonprofit versus a private one. But don't say if it's private that it's automatically bad. It could be good. Yeah. Um, I would say that if they're always trying to sell you something, if they're trying to sell you a specific product or a specific set of properties, then your your spidey sense should go up and say, well, maybe something's <laughs> nice. not quite right here. Yeah, um, you that's know, great you advice. Know, yeah, that's, be careful. Yeah, right on. But if on the other hand, if it's you know, yeah, they're trying to sell you something sometimes, but then it's networking and it's also classes and it's also panel discussions and other things where real local investors are talking to you. Then you've probably found the right place. Yeah, just leave your wallet at home, bring yeah. your cards, and uh, you know, <laughs> go have fun. Yeah, and, and when you're going out there at first, you probably do want to keep your cards close to the chest, feel it out, see yeah. what's going on. Uh, you know, trust your instincts. If it feels bad, it may be, but if if people are being open, yeah, it's good. Cool. All right. Well, uh, we are. You know, we're at like almost an hour now, so we better slowly start to wrap this up to okay. one of my new favorite parts of the show which is the fire, fire round. round yes wow. the fire round <laughs> you like that sounds great yeah, yeah. all right awesome. so the fire round is questions from the bigger pockets forums um, most ah. of these come directly from there and they're questions that actual people have asked and i want to get your advice on it so uh very first one how do you decide on rent on the rental amount for renewals when somebody's renewal comes up how do you know to raise a rent or keep it the same uh, you've got to stay abreast of your market. You've got to see what other investors are doing and what other properties are renting for. Uh, and, and again, it gets back, that's part of the networking, so you're with other investors and seeing what's going on. Um, it's going to be based on your market. If the market's going up and you can raise the rent, then certainly do so. But uh, if not, and you, want to, and you want to keep a good, steady-paying tenant, you know, then, then don't raise the rent. But obviously, if the market's hot, and has been raising or going up, then uh, yeah, you can raise it a little bit. Sure. Right on. Right on. Okay. Uh, during turnover, do you uh, rent your own DIY rug doctor, Home Depot steam cleaner, or, or do you go get uh, professionally uh, cleaned your carpets? At first, I did it myself, uh, but now I, I hire all that stuff out. And to a new folk, to a new person, I would say do it yourself first so you learn the cost, the expense, and how to do it. And as you grow and get bigger, then yeah, hire that stuff out. Cool. Uh, speaking of that, then best flooring for a rental? I like hardwood floors and ceramic tile. Ceramic tile in the kitchen and bath, hardwood floors everywhere else with tons of clear gloss polyurethane. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Keep it shiny. Keep it shiny. Mm-hmm. Shiny and hard and indestructible. Nice. Pretty much or close to it. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, my tenant moved out without any warning. What do I do? Uh, it depends on your state and what the laws say. Uh, here, I have got to. Uh, here, I've got to actually send a notice, and then I have to actually store their stuff for thirty days uh, if they're just abandoned. And then after that, I can pretty much declare it abandoned. I can take their stuff out, sell it, try to recoup any costs, and then re- clean and re-rent the unit. But they haven't given you notice that they have left. And so technically, possession is still theirs under the law. So if you, you have to be very careful. If you go in and start moving stuff, and then they show up, if they just went to Hawaii for 30 days and didn't tell you, then they come back, well, you know, I have $3,000 hidden under the mattress. Where is it? Grandma's gold ring is gone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can set yourself up to be burned quickly. Yep. Very, very good. Know your state statutes and what you have to do in that situation. That's great. And we have written a couple of good uh, articles on that, and, and uh, we'll see if we can scrap them up and put them in the show notes as well. Cool. All right, cash for keys. Uh, do you pay tenants to leave that you don't, you know, that instead of an eviction? I would prefer to sometimes, yes. Uh, it's cheaper generally than going through the eviction, and an eviction is expensive and it's adversarial, and I just don't like going down to the courthouse. Uh, it's generally cheaper. For me to pay cash for keys and I can tell the folks, look, get your stuff out, clean it up, broom sweep it, make it clean, and I will hear some cash to go. And uh, that's just, you know, I get my property, sign the possession form back to me. I got my property back. Uh, it's just easier. Yeah, yeah, it's cheaper and easier. Right I on. hate to do it. I hate to pay I somebody. To, <laughs> it hurts. I hate it. 
it hurts. And, you know, and, and yeah, I'd love to have my day in court and, and all of that. But, uh, it, you know, just pay him to get out. It's just going to be easier on, on everybody. Yeah. Breathe. You okay? Mm-hmm. Take a breath. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You yeah. seemed a little, you know, a little frustrated, but, a little angry. I get well, it. But, you know. On the flip side, though, I've only done, in 10 years, I've only done three evictions. Yeah. You know, I, I, I just, you know, I try to avoid that as much as I can. And, and that's probably a testament to your to your screening process. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, right on. All right, so how do you deal with tenants who pay rent late and don't call? Just rent shows up on the 8th and they don't say anything or the 12th. or And they haven't talked to me at all? Nope. Wow. Uh, they better start talking to me soon. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. That's really never happened. Uh, we talk to them and you know with texting now and all of that i mean they'll they'll get in touch with us somehow they're going to get a note on their door or something now if they just don't talk to me at all i mean i'm eventually going to get an fed warrant and that'll get their attention um and at that point if they pay lay again and keep doing it and not talking to me they're going to go and for those at the people, end of their lease they're going to go what, what's an fed warrant warrant I'm for sorry. those people who yeah have, uh, i have uh, no idea I've never Forcible heard of it. Forcible entry and detainer. It oh, is the okay. eviction warrant in Tennessee. Oh, okay. okay, gotcha. Yeah. Nice. And so you you sounds go a lot more hardcore. Than yeah, the, FED yeah. warrant. <laughs> ah. uh, Forcible entry and detainer. Yep, that's the eviction uh, here in Tennessee, and uh, uh, that what is what will be tacked on their door. Usually, just the service that's tacked on their door will get the get somebody calling you real quick. Nice. So, and that's that's when you can talk to them. Don't ever do that again. Nice. All right. Mm-hmm. Final section of the podcast today is our famous, famous four. That was that was very good. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't even know what you said. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this famous is four. Famous four. We ask these questions to every single person, and uh, here we go with you. Number one, okay. what is your favorite real estate book? My favorite real estate book. Uh, I don't know if I could narrow it down to one. I'm going to give you two, if that's okay. I. I Liked Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad for newbies because it gets your mind thinking differently about cash and money. And I also like the E-Myth for more experienced folks, uh, for building systems for businesses. I mean, that's just key when you get into this uh, is having systems in place to keep your sanity and to keep your business growing. Uh, So I would say those two. Nice. You, You know, if there's anybody listening to this podcast right now that hasn't read both those yet. Right. I mean... Almost every guest has one or the other or both. Yeah, pretty it's, much. Mm-hmm. It it's just it's depends amazing. on where you are in life for each one of those. If you're new, Kiyosaki. If you've been in it for a while, E Myth. Yep. Yeah. So so would that E Myth then be your your favorite non real estate business book? Yeah, they're both kind of non real estate. Yeah. Actually, yeah. they're more business business uh, books, uh, but they apply to real estate very well. Indeed. Indeed, absolutely. And what what about hobbies? Do you uh, do you do anything for fun other than kicking those three uh, tenants <laughs> out of your properties? Uh, that wasn't fun, believe me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I I like to read. I read quite a bit. Um, I uh, I like to teach. Uh, I still use those college degrees. I teach college level geography. I do that for fun. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I for fun am a uh, astronaut. So. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah I cool. just use my astrophysics degree for fun on that's the a, side. That's a complete lie, everyone. <laughs> Josh is lying. <laughs> he wouldn't lie to us, would he? No, never. No, never. Um, other than that, I like to I run uh, for exercise. I just ran a four-miler in 26 minutes on Friday. Nice. Um, and I play racquetball. Oh, right. uh, oh I love racquetball. Do you? I like I also, Memphis will play. I like it too, but I'd be afraid to play with the giant Sasquatch that is Brandon. <laughs> He's like eight feet tall. I'm and, actually you know. terrible at it, but it, it's 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 Wh- fun. I throw which people is around scarier. Yes. Uh-huh. I just uh-huh. run into people and throw them into the walls. Yeah, pretty much. Rawr. Full contact, <laughs> Rocky Ball. That's a good idea. Yeah. All right, Ooh. final. <laughs> final. By, question. by the way, that is fascinating. The whole geography thing. I I, I I'm a huge fan of geography, and uh, I think it's awesome. Well, and I enjoy teaching, which is part of the reason I like writing for you guys on Bigger Pockets, and I like going back to Maria and things like that. I just enjoy giving back and teaching and trying to get folks to do it right. Yeah, yeah. So. sure. Well, we definitely appreciate it. Um, final question. What do you believe sets apart the successful landlords from the non-successful ones, the ones that give up and fail or lose their properties or whatever? 
I think it's that they bet on something other than cash flow or didn't analyze the cash flow properly. Um, if you bet on appreciation, you're going to lose. You're speculating because, uh, you know, real estate does not always go up as we've so hard learned. Uh, but if you bet on cash flow, if you always have positive cash flow, who cares what your property's worth? You've still got proper cash flow coming in. Yeah. Uh, you're going to be able to eat. You're going to be able to buy gas all those other things, you're going to be able to ride over uh, the rough waves that we've just gone through. Hey, any, all the folks who are still standing today in my RIA club, et cetera, bet on cash flow. Those are the ones that are still uh, above water today. Yeah, nice. that's great. The, the folks who are flipping and trying it, they're gone. They're gone. Now, the flipping's good. You can do it. I'm not saying that's bad, but the ones who were just doing that, uh, and we're betting on appreciation. Most of those are most of those guys are gone now. Interesting, interesting. Well, I tell you, you know, Matt, your area is is kind of a hotbed of investor activity. There's certainly a it lot, is. lot of stuff happening. Memphis is, uh, yeah, Memphis is hot. Memphis it is. is. Hot, so. Memphis is one of the few cities uh, around where you can actually buy a property that will cash flow very well. Yeah. And we have folks coming here from, like I mentioned, Australia, New Zealand. I, at our RIA group, I meet folks from all over the world coming here and wanting to buy properties uh, in Memphis. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, everybody else stay away. We've got enough ah. to leave us <laughs> some of these deals. Awesome. Uh, but no, Memphis, Memphis is uh, uh, good, but, you know, don't let that be your only criteria. You know, come here, see it, make sure you understand everything going in uh, as to, you know, managing the property, finding tenants, understanding cash flow, all that. It's so important, especially if you're in Australia trying to manage this thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, listen, Kevin, that really, really great advice. Lots of uh, lots of good tips here, and we, we definitely want to thank you for taking the time to, to be on the show and, and, of course, also for being a uh, contributor to, to Bigger Pockets. We, uh, we really do appreciate it. Well, thank you. I really appreciate being here. Like I said, I, I kind of have the heart of a teacher. I, I enjoy giving back, so I, I'm glad to do it anytime. And your your website is, what is it again? Uh, my website, yes. I blog as well, smarterlandlording.com. Oh, thank you, Kevin. All right, guys, that was our show with Kevin Perk. Be sure to connect with Kevin on Bigger Pockets, uh, and uh, we'll have a link to his profile in the show notes. Also, also make sure you're connecting with Kevin over on his blog at smarterlandlording.com. That's smarterlandlording.com. Kevin is uh, is definitely a savvy landlord. What do you think, Brandon? I agree. I I learned a lot in this uh, this episode. So, yeah, yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Good I'm not stuff. sure how you learn anything lounging on your your couch here. I mean, <laughs> like, your energy's down. You're just kind of I don't know. Nah, man. Today There's today was, right today was good. Today is good. Today is, I, I'm learning and I'm relaxing and my feet are up. This is awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm not playing the drinking game. We're yeah. Good. But although somebody is, apparently we, we just got a, a tweet uh, at the time of us recording this from Luke Ward, which is who's <laughs> at, at OK Investors. And Luke said, uh, I will be definitely uh, doing the BP podcast adult beverage game this week. Haha. Ha, not just, just not full shots. Awesome. So. If you two want to partake in the Bigger Pockets adult drinking game, feel free <laughs> to take a shot of anything you want whenever we say awesome. Okay. All right. Moving on. Uh, don't forget, everybody, the, uh, the, uh, we're, we're doing this hashtag thing to give away uh, free copies of our Bigger Pockets book on flipping houses and estimating rehab costs. If you want a chance of winning a free copy of the ebooks, uh, just uh, share your favorite quote uh, from today's episode, Facebook, Twitter, or G Plus with the hashtag at uh, Pound Bigger Pockets, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll be looking out and uh, awarding our next winner at the next show. Otherwise, of course, make sure you're following us on Facebook, Twitter, G Plus, and so on. And the fast and easiest way to do that is just go to Bigger Pockets slash Facebook, Bigger Pockets slash G P L U S, Bigger Pockets slash LinkedIn so on and so forth, and you will find all our profiles. Um, otherwise, again, jump on the show notes, ask Kevin any questions you've got for him, uh, especially if they're pertaining to rental properties uh, or you know, working with uh, networking at RIAs and things like that. He's, he's definitely a pro at that stuff. 
and uh, connect uh, connect with us on Bigger Pockets. If you have not set up an account yet, what on earth are you waiting for? You will meet people like Kevin every single day, all day long. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of new posts every single day, new new discussions happening every day on Bigger Pockets. There's absolutely no reason you shouldn't be on there engaging, connecting with your peers. And uh, so do it. If you just set up a profile, get out and connect, introduce yourself, ask questions, answer questions. The more you do that, the more you're going to meet other people, build your business. So do it, do it, do it. That's it. This is me. I'm Josh. I am signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Here to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. 